So my name's Patrick Roach. I'm a tutor in physics at Hartford College. And today we're just going to be exploring a topic in special relativity. And so we have two of our students who have just completed the first year um, with me today. So Hannah, would you like to say hello? Hi, I'm Hannah. Uh, yeah, I just finished my first year at physics at Hartford. Um, hey, I'm Nahum. I also just finished my first year here at Hartford. So this term, we've had to conduct our tutorials remotely using um, online resources such as Microsoft Teams and Zoom. And so right now we're using Zoom and we're recording just a short interaction between the three of us to talk about a topic in special relativity. And so the first one is the well-known train in the tunnel problem. And in this case, we have a train which has got a proper length of 100 meters. So that's a length in its rest frame of 100 meters. And traveling at the unlikely speed of 99% of the speed of light uh, in and in the frame of the tracks in which it's running. And it passes through a tunnel of length 90 meters. And so what we want to explore is what someone standing on the platform would see and what someone on the train would see. So maybe Hannah will start with you and just ask you to say how you go about tackling this. Yes, yeah, so um, in special relativity we have the Lorentz transformations which talks about how um, objects traveling at different speeds close to the speed of light will experience different things so that um, length and time and simultaneity differ between frames so I would choose a frame to kind of call my uh, rest frame for the train and then use these Lorentz uh, transformations and specifically Lorentz contraction to see how uh, to the train and to the pa um, person on the platform how the train would or the tunnel would appear to contract because of its speed yeah. so then according to the person on the platform the train contracts to about 14 meters so it would appear to be in the tunnel but within the train, the tunnel contracts, which then suggests that to the train it's not fully in the tunnel. Yeah, so, so that's the well-known paradox of uh, the train in the tunnel problem. Uh, and the contraction comes from the, as you say, the uh, Lorentz transforms and the contraction fa factor itself is given by the um, the well-known gamma factor, which in this case is 7.1. Okay, so Nahom, as Hannah said, the, the, we have this paradox that uh, from one point of view the train can fit and from the other it seems that it can't. So, so how would you try and explain that paradox? Um, so the issue would come in to um, the whole part about the simultaneity of time and so if you're measuring the length of the train as it passes through the train station, the stationary observer relative to the train tracks would actually measure the two different ends of the train at different times. And so um, if you measure it just before it enters and then measure the back of it just before, I mean, just before it leaves, then the length that you can measure would be consistent and show that it does fit the tunnel since you're measuring it at different times from your perspective. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's the issue, isn't it? It's the fact that um, observers in different reference frames have different um, views of what the same time is. Yeah. And that's as a result of the finite speed of light. So, so that's one example of a paradox in special relativity. And of course, there are many others. And uh, 
and you know, I hope that you found the course interesting and perhaps a bit perplexing in places. Yeah, it was very counterintuitive, but um, it was quite interesting to find out how all of these came from a few simple assumptions about the speed of light and reference rates. Yeah, yeah. yeah and uh, to me, that's one of the astonishing things. Yeah. yeah. Einstein was able to revolutionize it by just doing these kind of thought experiments. Welcome to Hartford College. My name is Sid Parameshwaran, and I'm a fellow and tutor in physics at Hartford. I'm also an associate professor in theoretical physics, where I lead a research group that focuses on the low temperature properties of quantum materials and their links to quantum computing and quantum information. At Hartford, I primarily tutor students on the second and third years of the course. My colleague, Pat Roche, has already given you an introduction to the first year of the course, where you build a basic understanding of classical mechanics and electromagnetism. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what happens in the second, third, and fourth years of the course. I'm gonna do this using a virtual blackboard. This will give you a sense of how we've managed to have interactive tutorials, despite being unable to meet in person due to social distancing. The second year is in many ways the core of the physics course and covers three main topics. The first of these is a continuation of your studies of electromagnetism. And in this year, you will explore how electromagnetism behaves in materials and also how it is linked to optics. A new topic introduced this year that students find very interesting and exciting is the physics of quantum mechanics. And this is essential in order to apply to the laws of physics to describe the very small, such as atoms or molecules. A third strand of the second year is what is known as statistical physics. And statistical physics is uh, the technique that we need in order to use the laws of physics to describe very large collections of atoms, molecules, or other particles, such as those present in liquids, gases, and solids. And it's deeply connected to the physics of thermodynamics. Throughout the second year, you'll also continue your practical course, uh, exploring some of the ideas introduced in the year in a laboratory setting. You'll also have to spend some time reading on a topic of phys uh, related to physics of your choice and give a short presentation on this to your classmates and tutors. Throughout the year, you'll also build mathematical skills necessary to tackle the more advanced problems that come up as you go deeper into the physics course. And of course, there will be an array of short options for you to choose from in order to explore the subject further. At the end of the second year, you'll have a pretty solid foundation in which to explore the wide range of physics that you'll see in the third year. In the third year, you will apply the foundational concepts developed in the first two years to explore a wide range of topics in modern physics. Now, there's some flexibility in the specific set of topics that you can study, but the choices include concepts of symmetry and special relativity, In fact, you'd have already seen some special relativity earlier in the course. Another choice is to study condensed matter. And this is large collections of atoms, electrons, molecules, and so on that appear, for instance, in solids and liquids. And one of the things you learn in this course is how physics can allow us to explain why some systems are metals, some systems are insulators, and why some materials are semiconductors. You'll also learn more about what happens at the subatomic scale in nuclear and particle physics. And this will involve uh, making connections to experiments such as those done at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. You'll also have a chance to explore fluid mechanics and the physics of fluids. You'll be able to learn a little bit about uh, atomic and laser physics. And if you're, uh, for those of you who enjoyed relativity, there'll be a chance to go further and explore Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is the 
techniques that you need to describe gravity properly and to understand things like black holes and cosmology. Another option that is increasingly popular is that students can replace some of these with a computational or an experimental project, which goes beyond the standard lab courses. Of course, you'll have some short options this year, as well as um, the standard practical course. And as part of the practical course, you will pick one of the labs and go deeper into it and write it up in a more formal lab report that is known as a mini project. At the end of this year, you will have explored a large range of topics in physics and have some sense of what kind of choices you'd like in, uh, in order like to make in order to specialize into the fourth year. The fourth year of the course is a point at which you specialize your study of physics into one of the major areas of modern physics. This is taught primarily in the department and your tutorials will be with other students from other colleges that are taking the same options um, as you are. Despite this, your tutors will of course be available for advice and career guidance. Students who are going on in the MPhys track will choose two major options from a set that represent the different research areas in the department. These include astrophysics, condensed matter, lasers, and quantum information, biophysics, particle physics, atmospheric and oceanic physics with links to climate science, and my own specialty, theoretical physics. Some of the more mathematically minded students switch to the four, uh, fourth year course known as the Masters in Mathematical and Theoretical Physics, or MMAT Phys. And this is a course that's taught jointly with the Maths Institute and allows students to take a flexible array of courses spread across both departments. At the end of your four years, you will have built a very strong technical background in physics that's excellent preparation for further study in the field or related fields through a doctoral program or other means. You have also developed extremely strong quantitative and problem solving skills that are applicable to a wide range of careers. I should say a little bit about the environment at Hartford, which is friendly and supportive. We have a wide range of expertise, both in long term tutorial staff and among the tutors who cover specialized topics across all areas of physics. All of us are research active and our tutorials often borrow insights from the forefront of modern research and bring it to bear on the problems that you're discussing in the course. Our students are a particularly tight knit group and they organize termly dinners and participate in various extra activities. For example, several students joined me in an extracurricular reading project on quantum information last year. Our students often do research in the summer, sometimes supported by college bursaries, and many have gone on to further study for their DPhils, as well as successful careers outside of academia in a wide variety of fields. I hope this has been a useful look into the physics course and into physics at Hartford, and I do hope that you will apply to join us next year.